Okay. All right, thank you all so much for joining us for our energy lunch presentation at the Winnesheek Energy District. Um, this uh, presentation I'm super excited about. We have Natalie McIntyre, who is a um, electrical engineer and consultant for the Clean Grid Alliance. Um, and she's gonna give us a, a short overview of um, sort of the US grid and then open the floor for questions and let us, the audience, um, sort of talk about, ask her what we wanna know about. Um, so with that, I'm gonna pass it over to you, Natalie. Thanks, Heidi, and um, I really appreciate the invitation uh, from you and from the Energy District. Uh, really looking forward to this conversation today. I want to make one correction. Heidi said I'm an electrical engineer. I'm actually a mechanical engineer by training. Um, so uh, it's unfortunate because if I was a power systems engineer, I think I would be even better at the work that I do. Um, but I have been working in the energy space uh, for about 20 years. Um, mostly focused on transmission issues. Uh, so we'll get into that a little bit more, but I have worked for nonprofit organizations uh, that are working towards uh, increasing the opportunities for renewable energy resources. So wind, solar, geothermal, tidal, et cetera. Um, and now uh, we include in that work uh, energy storage resources that especially those that are connected with other renewable resources. So we're really trying to address the rules and regulations around um, accessing the transmission grid, the transmission system, uh, and also around market rules for participating in energy markets to make sure that those rules and regulations are technology neutral, non-discriminatory. So that's just a little bit of background on me. And I have put together just, you know, I know that some of you have read a book recently called The Grid. Uh, I can't say that I have finished that book. I did get a start in it. Um, and maybe others of you have a variety of other experience in energy issues. So maybe we can have a, a broad ranging conversation, but I put together just um, a few slides to kind of give us a background and backdrop for that conversation. So let me um, begin to share my slides. And I don't think it will take us uh, long to get through these and then we can just open it up. You can feel free to um, take me back to any of these images uh, or we can we can discuss other things that you'd like to, to talk about. So I really put this uh, together around the idea of both the transmission grid itself, but thinking about how we move into the future and where we're going, because that's a, where a lot of the work that I um, am involved in is going, you know, how we're planning for the future. So just by way of background, um, when we talk about the grid, we're really talking uh, about the system as a whole. I mean, often we think about the lines themselves, but it's really the, the whole system from the generation resources, um, some of our traditional generation resources like coal and gas and nuclear, and you can include some large scale hydro um, in those energy producers. The, the various large transmission lines that, that take that power to communities, distribution lines that take, um, take the power to individual homes and individual businesses, uh, and of course, those consumers themselves, uh, from you all in your, your homes to businesses, um, corporations, et cetera, all of us using power. Um, when we think about planning uh, for the grid, we think about it in a couple different time frames. We do a lot of planning in advance of the need. So thinking about what kind of growth there might be in demand and planning to build new power plants uh, to meet that demand. Uh, we also think about, uh, you know, in the, the day ahead or even the week ahead, you know, what's the weather doing? Is it going to be colder tomorrow? Are we going to be experiencing more heat? Um, you know, those sorts of things in terms of what what demands might be on the system so that we can ensure that the right generators are online and ready to serve the consumers uh, and their needs. Um, so both the long-term planning for generation and also the wires needed to, to take the gener that electricity from the generation to homes and businesses. And then just sort of the, the nearer term, what do we need tomorrow? What do we need next week? And how are we making sure that we have those resources available? And then, we also are, 
operating that and making adjustments in real time. So the, the, the grid itself needs to have the demand, you know, the consumption of electricity, basically equal to the generation of electricity. And so we need to be adjusting that. Largely, we are adjusting um, the generation to make sure that it is matching the, the demand or the need at that point. Because if we don't have those two things balanced, then we have some big problems. <laughs> we have lines overheating, we have generators that can trip offline and that will cause to, um, sort of a domino effect of more, more problems on the grid. So really trying to have a balance there. So when we're planning the day in, ahead, we don't, we don't usually get that exactly right. And that's that lower image there in terms of the, the load forecast, what was expected um, the day ahead when we were planning versus what actually showed up in, in real time that day. And so we're, we're balancing um, hour to hour and minute to minute that balance. So general sense of the grid. Yeah, let me see if I can move ahead here. This is just a, to give you a sense of like who, who's responsible here, who's in charge of managing all of the details of this. Um, we have at the national level, we have the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission that really deals with um, energy markets uh, and uh, resource siting, uh, et cetera, th things of that nature. Then we have the North American Electric Reliability Corporation, which really is setting standards um, for how we operate the grid reliably. Um, and then we come down sort of a level to the regional level. Uh, you all are in the, the footprint of the mid-continent independent system operator, which is a regional transmission operator, uh, independent from the utilities that it serves. Um, but really uh, that the role of that organization is to, to manage the transmission system um, and to dispatch the generation on that system in the most cost-effective way for consumers. Uh, and then we have state regulators also, so similar to our federal regulators, but the states are really um, operating within the states for transmission siting within the state. Uh, and also um, doing a lot of work uh, with the utilities to make sure that they're planning uh, for the needs in the future and also that the, the rates that consumers pay are reasonable relative to the cost of the utilities. Um, and the utilities, in addition to that, just sort of general planning are also assisting in this sort of day-to-day -day operation and scheduling generation. So. But we're seeing a lot of shift. We're seeing a lot of change. Um, this has sort of been happening over time, but I think it's really wrapping up um, more recently in the last couple of years and, and may continue to do so. A shift um, away from more thermal generation towards cleaner uh, resources like solar and wind. Um, and we're seeing more recently still energy storage being a piece of that mix. Um, so largely battery storage, but energy storage can also be um, sort of pumped hydro. Uh, we, we also have other forms of energy storage, but what we're seeing more recently is a, uh, an increase in the development of battery storage because um, the prices of these resources, the prices of solar, the prices of wind and batteries have been dramatically dropping over the last few years. And so in terms of the work that I do and the organizations that I work for uh, are doing for, for a long period of time, we were really trying to push utilities to invest more in these resources. But as the prices are coming down, that's less of our work. We, we aren't needing to tell them that they need to do more solar and wind. Um, because those resources really are the least cost for consumers today. So that's a lot of what we're seeing uh, in terms of this, this shift in generation. And that means that we need to plan uh, and prepare the system a little differently because these resources operate differently. So let's move on. How is it that we plan for the future? Uh, we, we do it on a variety of different um, focus areas. Uh, I'm going to list a couple here uh, and, and that'll sort of wrap up our presentation today. Uh, I do have one more slide on long range transmission planning that I'll talk about as it relates to 
the region that the state of Iowa is in. Um, but then we'll just open it up. So uh, the MISO, the independent system operator in the Midwest that I mentioned, does a variety of uh, planning processes. One recent study that they just com completed that actually took uh, over three years was the Renewable Integration Impact Assessment. So they were really looking broadly at what challenges might arise as the, the amount of renewable resources, it's sort of the penetration of those resources in terms of a percentage um, increases on the system. So looking at 10%, 20%, all the way up to 50%. And I just wanna highlight very briefly um, sort of the couple key takeaways of that. The first being that that study um, suggests the, the results of that study suggest that the region can get to 30% renewable using the tools and approaches that, that the utilities and the grid operator use today. So it doesn't mean that they don't need to um, do some work in order to, to manage the system with higher penetrations of renewables up to 30%, but that the tools that they have today are sufficient to do that. Beyond that, um, and the study only went up to 50% renewables, um, but it did indicate that the region can reach 50% renewables as well reliably, but we'll need to look towards um, new technologies, uh, new market products, uh, things, uh, sort of new tools and, and working together, uh, collaborating and coordinating amongst all of the utilities, et cetera, in order to reach that 50%. So, one important study, and I think really one of the most technical studies of its nature. Certainly there have been other uh, studies across the country in terms of how can we reach higher levels of renewables. Um, long range transmission planning. Uh, so the, the, the MISO, as well as the individual utilities, uh, the transmission owning utilities, are planning for their systems uh, on an annual basis. But occasionally they do this sort of broader, more holistic um, approach to transmission planning to try to look at the various needs on the system from reliability needs to um, drivers uh, in terms of economic drivers, um, needs to interconnect new generators, et cetera. So trying to plan um, what the system needs to look like taking into account all of those needs at once. So uh, a really important effort that's underway right now. Uh, resource adequacy is a planning process that really takes into account what generators are needed into the future. Uh, that's done largely uh, on an annual basis, but there also um, is sort of a, a a forward look to make sure that we're planning far enough in advance. A lot of the resource adequacy planning is done in coordination with the states because it's the state authority under those um, state utility commissions. Those, those organizations have the authority for um, which resource choices are being made. Uh, and the last thing that I, that I included here is not so much a planning process, but just the fact that um, we have these new technologies, both uh, battery storage on its own and also hybrid resources. Hybrid resources being a combination at a site of um, more than one generating type. So it could be a solar plus battery hybrid. It could be a wind plus battery hybrid. Um, those resources are really offering new capabilities that we're trying to include in these planning processes because batteries are very flexible and they offer a variety of different um, types of services to the grid. So the last thing I wanted to share is just a little bit more about this long range transmission planning process. Uh, the planning process in the MISO uh, really looks at planning for a variety of different futures. Because when we look 20 years into the future, we don't really know exactly what that's gonna look like. And so by looking at more than one potential future, we can try to plan for transmission that is beneficial under all those possibilities. Um, right now, that, that process includes three futures. 
but the focus this year is really on trying to identify what transmission might be needed to meet the needs under future one. And future one really is defined by utility plans. So what is already included in the plans of utilities within this region for new generation? Um, and you can see uh, on the left there that we, over this 20 year period, we see a lot of coal retirement and we see a lot of additions of solar, wind, and also additional gas resources. So what transmission is needed to meet those needs? And then uh, this sort of uh, map that's on the right, you can see just the first pass at what, what lines might be able to meet those needs. A lot more work will happen, um, a lot more technical analysis, uh, and also gathering information from the states and from the utilities uh, to determine what transmission lines might um, might be the best and the most cost effective. But that's a little bit more about that planning process for how we get to the future. Um, there are lots more things that I could talk about uh, with those um, with these topics that I've raised in, in these first slides. But what I'd really love to do is know more about what you all are interested in hearing about. Uh, I'm sure that there are folks on this call who have experience um, in areas that I'm, I'm not an expert in. And so maybe you can help uh, jump into this conversation as well. So happy to open it up and see where, where you all wanna go from here. We do already have some questions in the chat, so I'll start with those. But if you want to, um, if anyone also wants to speak their own question rather than typing it, feel free to unmute um, and ask a question. Uh, so when you were when you were showing that first graph where actual load is more than forecasted, how is that excess energy made up? Is an energy stored and then sent out as needed? Okay, so when we look at this actual versus um, forecast, the forecast happens largely day ahead or week ahead. So um, in when we get to the day that we're actually in today, uh, that balance is adjusted uh, by adjusting largely the generation resources. Uh, this is one of the things about the electricity grid that I find the most amazing. It is when you think of the, the whole of it, the combination of the generators, the, the consumers and the wires, it's really one of the most complicated machines that we have in the world. I mean, certainly one of the largest when you, when you think of it as a whole. But um, what happens in real time to make up the difference, we don't tend to store that energy. Uh, we tend to just adjust the generation. There are ways to store that energy and we do imagine that batteries will help us to do that. Um, there are ways to use the hydro systems to sort of store energy behind the dam, but largely we're adjusting the balance in real time. Many of the generators that are on the system have what we call automatic generator control. And so when they see, they can, those generators automatically can sense on the system that there is more demand. Maybe a large corporation just turned on a large manufacturing site all of a sudden there's more demand. Those generators react instantaneously. If a bunch of homes in an area, I don't know, they're all going to bed at the same time, they're turning off, there's lights and there's less demand. There is an automatic reaction from many of the generators on the grid. So that's, that's one of the amazing things that helps to balance that in real time. The other thing is that we have system operators, people who are sitting in front of computers every hour of every day watching the system um, and not necessarily manually, but indicating to certain generators, we need you, we can see that the, the demand is going up over the next few hours, more maybe than we thought it was going to. We need you to move beyond just that automatic adjustment that's, that's more um, bit by bit. We need you to ramp up on a more consistent basis, or we need you to ramp down. And so those operators are um, basically directing, kind of directing traffic, um, but directing the, the generators to go up or to go down as needed so that we balance this uh, every minute of every day. So hope that helps to answer that question. Is the current rate of transition to renewable energy moving quickly enough to be carbon free by 2050? <laughs> 
Oh my goodness, that's a really good question. <laughs> um, I, I do this work because I am concerned about climate change and I am very hopeful. Um, and I think we're seeing a lot of positive change in terms of that shift. Um, we're seeing a lot of commitments being made by utilities, by municipalities, by states, by corporations, really moving in that direction. That is all really good. In order to make it happen, there is a huge amount of work that needs to be done. Um, when we look at the MISO system, so this Midwest grid that I, that I shared that, that um, you folks in Iowa are part of, we're at a little more than 10% renewable right now. And that 10% is largely wind, and it's been built over about the last 20 years. So if we want to get to 100% carbon reduction from 10% renewables in a matter of 30 years, that's a long way to go. We need to be building a lot more resources and a much more rapid rate, and we need to be building new transmission in order to both deliver the energy from those resources to consumers and also to be able to um, move that power around the grid. Uh, so I'm hopeful. Uh, I, I also think we have a lot of work to do ahead of us. The other thing I would add to that um, is that, you know, there are a lot of uh, experts much smarter than I am working on the questions of how we reach 100% renewable resources in our electricity system. And I think the truth is that they are not quite sure how we get there yet. Um, it's pretty clear from the research that I've read and from the studies that have been done that we can get to 80%. Um, but that last 20% is gonna be the most challenging because we're really talking about generating resources like wind and solar that are variable. So the, the ability to store that power when it's being generated and then be able to deliver it later when those resources might not be generating it as much is going to be really critical for that, um, for reaching that 100% goal. So, um, so I don't know if we can do it by 2050, but we're shooting for it. What sorts of tools and technologies might be needed in the 30 to 50% renewables range? What is the outlook beyond 50%? Good question. So a lot of the differences that we see between 30 and 50% um, are about how we operate the grid and what market products we have. So when we, have, when we talk about the electricity system, the electricity grid and markets, we, we basically Right now, we, we pay for energy and we pay for capacity. Um, for anyone who's not really part of this, the space, the idea of capacity might not make a lot of sense. Um, it's clear we need energy in real time, but we also need, um, we need resources that we can call upon, that we can dispatch when needed. And that's really what we ta we're talking about when we talk about capacity. So, um, but those are the only two things that we really value today. But we, in order to operate the grid beyond 30% um, in, a, in a system where we've got much more variable resources, we need to be able to value flexibility more. So we need market products that um, provide the right financial incentive for resources to be flexible, to adjust readily, and also to, provide the right incentive so that developers and utilities build more resources that are very flexible. Um, let me take us back to this slide. Um, and you can see that when we look at 2020, we have about 71, this is gigawatts <laughs> of gas generation. But when we look at 2039, we've got a lot more gas generation. Um, clearly, this, is, this future is not getting us to a 100% carbon reduction by 2050, but you can see the value that they're placing on gas generation because it is much more flexible than coal generation, being able to adjust minute to minute. So um, flexibility and new market products are, I think, a real important aspect. Um, and that's 
uh, largely because we're going to need to operate the thermal plants differently. So when we um, when generators are scheduled today, the gas generators are, you know, they move up in the morning when people are getting up and turning their lights on and taking showers. And then they, they sort of, you know, throughout the day, they're, they're sort of at this hump. And then towards the evening, actually towards the evening, there tends to be another little hump um, as people come home and turn on their heats, their heat uh, when we're not in a COVID situation. And then towards the end of the day, they come down. Um, but those thermal generators, when we have a lot more renewables on the system, they're going to need to go up and down a lot more. So ramping those generators, uh, that's what we call it when we, when we bring them up and we bring them down. Um, we're going to need to operate them a lot differently. So that's another thing uh, that's, that's important here. More transmission. Uh, I'm not sure that that's necessarily a different thing than what we need up to 30%, but uh, I think we need to think about transmission differently. Uh, largely because we're not just thinking about making sure that the energy goes from the generator to the load or to the consumers, but we're also thinking about transmission to move the generation from one area to another part of the grid, if that makes sense. Um, and for the, the resources uh, and the diversity amongst those resources to be shared well. Um, let me see if I can try to describe this a little bit better. So if we've got wind plants in Minnesota, but we've also got wind plants in Michigan or Illinois, we wanna be able to make sure that we have a transmission grid that can move that power from one area to another in case the wind is blowing in Minnesota and Iowa, but it's not blowing in Indiana and Michigan. Um, also, similarly, when we have a lot more solar on the system, we wanna be able to move that solar to where it's needed. And one of the interesting things about solar is that it, where it's generating the most moves throughout the day. So it'll be generating more in Michigan and Indiana uh, in the earlier part of the day, and it'll be generating more on the western part of the MISO grid um, in the later part of the day. So that's a different way to think about our transmission planning. So that was probably a lot, but maybe it helped to start answering that question. What is the status of additional high capacity interconnections between the eastern and western grids? Ah, good question. Um, there certainly wow. is a lot of talk about that, um, but I'm not aware of any particular new connections being planned between the Eastern and Western interconnections. For, um, let me see, anyone who is not as familiar with what this question is about, our, our grid in this country is operated in three different interconnections, um, three different regions that have a lot of transmission lines that are well connected, but those three regions are not well connected with each other. So um, we have the Eastern Interconnect, which is basically cuts through part of Montana and kind of down this way um, and goes around most of Texas. And we have the Western Inter Interconnect, which is largely all the Western states and also cuts around Texas. And then we have the single interconnection, which is most of Texas. Um, and those three are not well connected. Uh, there, is, there are some connections and there's some ability to move power between them, but it's limited. Um, so this is a really good question, uh, especially in light of, I'm sure what you all heard on the news in February where we had the serious cold snap or the polar vortex down in, um, in Texas and the Southern states. One of the real big challenges for Texas was that there's, there was sort of a lack of ability to import power from the other interconnections. Um, so I'm not aware of any new uh, planned connections between our Western and Eastern interconnections, uh, but I, I think it is a good question. And I think that there is the, it increases the potential for us to manage the higher levels of renewables. So as I said before, um, we've got solar moving across the country as the sun moves. You know, if we have the ability for California and the West to deliver some of that solar to the Eastern part of our country when it's dark, uh, 
that will help us manage um, manage the grid with higher levels of, of renewables. So I, there's definitely a lot of consideration of new connections between those uh, large uh, interconnections, but um, but I'm not aware of any today that are active in terms of going forward. When James Hansen spoken to Cora a couple of years ago, he stressed the need to use more nuclear power to combat global warming. What are your thoughts on that? <sighs> um, this is one of those issues that is particularly challenging, especially for someone who's worked in, you know, work, does this work for, um, you know, for environmental reasons. There are a lot of concerns, of course, around nuclear energy um, and, and the waste, the environmental impacts of the waste, particularly, and, and of course, the potential for serious um, environmental challenges if we have an issue like uh, Fukushima down in Japan. Um, so those are real issues that we need to, to think about. On the other hand, nuclear doesn't produce any carbon. Um, and so when we're thinking about how we get to 100% clean energy uh, or 100% carbon reduction, it might need to be one of the tools in our toolbox, uh, especially as we move towards that. Um, so it is, it's a resource that um, we can turn on and we can turn off, which is good because we can't really turn on the wind and turn off the wind, uh, for example. However, nuclear power is one of the least flexible resources that we have. I think that there, I've been reading articles recently about how to operate nuclear power more flexibly so that it can help to um, make those adjustments minute to minute, um, hour to hour every day. But typically it has been run what, as what we call a baseload power plant. So it's turned on at a certain level and it runs at that level for months and months on end. Um, when we do have uh, a nuclear power plant that that comes offline either for maintenance or because of um, what we call a forced outage, which is it just something happens and trips it offline. It can take weeks to bring them back online. So they they are not particularly flexible, uh, at least the, the nuclear power plants we have today. I have also been reading um, more research about small scale nuclear, um, which may be more flexible. Um, both in terms of its ability to, to come online and offline, but also to be able to make those fine adjustments. So, so my answer is mixed. I still have concerns, but I also know that it is um, a resource that produces electricity without producing carbon. And that can be a really important tool in our tool belt as we move towards 100% renewables. What shifts need to happen to encourage more rooftop capacity in terms of regulation, grid reaction, utility business models? Uh, okay, so this is a question that I'm not gonna be as good at <laughs> answering. Um, so many times in the work that I do, people will ask me, so in my state where I live, what can I do to get solar on my roof? Um, that's not the area that I do a lot of work in. And so I'm just really not an expert in that area. I'm more, much more focused on transmission lines, uh, markets, et cetera. Um, I hope that this, this questioner might be able to reach out to their local utility or to a, a local environmental organization that's more focused on small scale renewables. Definitely, I think as we move towards more renewables, there is an important role for both the small scale on individual consumer homes, individual businesses, and also the large utility scale resources. Um, you know, if 100% if carbon reduction is our goal, we need, we need all, um, all ships to float. <laughs> so, sorry, I couldn't be more help on that one. I heard a speaker say there will be guns involved by irate landowners in getting sufficient long distance transmission permitted permitted for a high renew renewables future. What is your opinion? Okay, I'm, I'm not going to say anything specifically about guns, but um, I think the question raises a really important issue, which is that transmission siting is very challenging. Um, 
I think I, I've discussed a little bit here about some of the challenges and the, the long-term need for transmission planning. It, it's not something that we do easily uh, and we can't do it in a year. So we can't say, oh, we need a transmission line next year. Um, that can't happen. It takes years to do the planning. And then it takes, you know, I would say two to 10 years to go through the siting process, the permitting, the construction. So the planning process that we are in right now, this, whoops, this one, um, to see those lines come, come to fruition, we're, we're talking probably seven to 20 years before all of those lines would be built. So, and in that whole process that I mentioned, I think siting is really one of the most challenging aspects to developing new transmission. Um, uh, a quote that I hear a lot lately because we're talking a lot about transmission planning uh, is if you like renewables, you need to like transmission. But really most people don't like transmission. I'm the first to admit that they're not particularly attractive and I'm not sure I would want them right outside my window, even though I might like a wind turbine outside my window. <laughs> Um, I know everyone has different perspectives on that as well. Not, not everyone is supportive of having wind close to their house. So I, I respect that. Um, but so that public process is really challenging for siting. I mean, there are a variety of other issues with siting too. We need to make sure that transmission lines have um, reasonable right of ways, uh, that they don't go too close to schools, that they don't go too close to the hospitals a variety of different issues. Um, of course, natural protected areas are another area of concern. So when we think about planning the grid, we really want to try to use the existing corridors that already have transmission um, as much as we possibly can. So the idea there being, let's take an, an area that we have a transmission line that might be a small capacity and um, increase the capacity uh, of that line. Uh, the other thing that we can do in terms of addressing some of these siting issues is to try to use other corridors that are less contentious. So siting um, transmission lines along, um, along highways, along railroad tracks, those sorts of things where um, we're, we have less impact on the neighbors or the natural areas. So. So along the lines of siting transmission along railroad tracks, we've got the Sioux Green Line in oh. Iowa that's uh -huh. in process, but then there's no DC, that's a DC transmission, is that right? It is high voltage DC, yes. Um, in the future one graph, there are no other, there are no DC lines. Is it, is, can you talk about that? <laughs> yes, great question. Um, so the map that I showed you there is, um, is the first pass, you know, I think that there will be discussions there about DC lines. Um, also, you can see that in this graph, we've got future one listed. There are also two other futures and there is a, a graphic similar to this map with lines plotted on it, um, potential lines for futures two and three. And there are some high voltage DC lines in those futures. Those futures are more aggressive in terms of the amounts of renewables that are being brought online and also the amounts of electrification and electric vehicles that are modeled. So um, those, those other futures are sort of um, modeling more aggressive uh, carbon reduction uh, potential futures. So we do see more DC, uh, HVDC lines there. Um, so I do expect that we likely will need HVDC lines uh, and getting back to the question earlier about um, connections between our two large regions, the Western interconnection and the Eastern interconnection, HVDC lines might be a really valuable um, way, a, a, a very appropriate way to, to connect those regions as well. So um, HVDC lines are very different than AC lines. Uh, they tend to have fewer connection points uh, across the grid. So they tend to be trying to deliver a lot of power from one area to another area and not so many connections along the way where uh, AC lines have often a number of connections and we tend to 
have sort of a web of transmission lines that are connected that way. But um, HVDC lines are sort of long haul. Um, one of the benefits is that they have much, uh, they're much more efficient. So less energy is lost in the transportation of that electricity. So that's a really good benefit. Um, one of, uh, I'm not that familiar with the Sioux Green line that you mentioned, um, but my understanding of that development is that there's a, one of the key goals is um, to basically be a, a collection point in the, the, the western part of the MISO footprint there, Iowa, Minnesota area, collection point for a lot of wind generation, and then sending that power a long distance towards Chicago, where we have, of course, a lot of demand, but also Chicago is in a different, um, not in a different interconnection, but in a different um, uh, system. So the Midwest, the MISO is in one system, and then the Chicago is in what we call PJM, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, Maryland um, region. So um, that's another important piece of that connection. Uh, we, in addition to not having very many connections between our large interconnections, we also don't have a lot of connections uh, between the, the ISO regions in our country. So I don't, I, I didn't know we would quite get to this level of detail, but um, I didn't put up a map or include a map of the, the various ISO regions, but we've got the, the MISO here, which goes from the northern Midwest states and now, now includes some of the southern states, but we've got the Southwest Power Pool, we've got the PJM region, um, New York ISO is another um, independent system operator, we have New England ISO, so all of those are within our eastern interconnect. Given the complexities and vulnerabilities of the grid, what about more local generation so there is less reliance on the grid? Um, good question. I, I am of the mind that we need both. We need more local generation, um, but uh, I think it's really challenging to think about having only local generation in a cost-effective way. So when we think about the fact that um, the sun doesn't shine in every part of the country at the same level and at the same time, or the wind might not be blowing in every part of the country at the same way, and the importance of being able to move that electricity to other parts of the country that need it, um, that is kind of the same situation that we face with local generation. So um, it definitely serves a, an important role and I think we need a lot more of it. But if we were to rely solely on local generation, we would need to have a lot more storage in order to reach 100% um, clean energy. So um, we would need to build, and more generation, frankly, we would need to build a lot more, for instance, a lot more solar on someone's roof and they would need to have a really big battery so that they can go a couple days without, um, without generating much power, but still be able to meet their electricity needs. So um, I think that when we think about doing this and getting to higher levels of clean energy cost effectively, it really helps to share that electricity um, across the grid um, and, and within a community for that matter. So. That's part of why we've seen um, roof scale uh, or yeah, you know, consumer scale solar largely built um, without batteries because the battery aspect of it um, is, is a very costly part. Um, and if we just rely solely on that one aspect, um, then we need a lot more batteries. So it's really more a cost question than I think it is um, whether or not we could do it. I mean, I think we could do it. Do utilities hop among the three grids? Can MISO improve our stance on moving towards renewables by attracting other utilities to leave their grid and join ours? Quote, beggar thy neighbor. <laughs> um, that, that's an interesting question. Uh, I have only, I think I've only known of one or two utilities that have switched um, switched grids or switched uh, regional operators. 
Um, there were a couple utilities in the far eastern part of the MISO grid that I believe um, probably five or more years ago moved to the PJM area. Largely, I think, because they were just much more, they were much closer to the rest of that grid. Um, but it is a question that comes up all the time. Um, in part because the transmission owners and the utilities want to have it the way they want to have it. Um, you know, they don't want to pay for it. They want to be able to do things the way they want to do things. But when they're part of this regional grid and they have to work with other utilities and other states, there's a lot of compromise that happens. And that's not always easy. Um, and you don't always get everything that you want. Um, so uh, there, there often are utilities or states saying, oh, we, we don't want to be part of this anymore. Um, I actually think that there's a, there's a process going on right now, just recently started um, at the Mississippi um, Public Utility Commission to evaluate um, Mississippi's participation in MISO. So what we tend to see is more utilities thinking that they want to leave rather than utilities thinking that they want to join. But that does happen also. I know that um, I think it's down in Memphis, there's a small municipal that's thinking about uh, joining MISO. Um, so it tends to be utilities that are in areas that are not served yet by, um, by an ISO, an independent grid operator that want to join one. So less about jumping from one to the other uh, and more about moving from an area that, that doesn't have this kind of uh, grid sharing and resource sharing um, where utilities are operating basically sort of on their own, those utilities we see more wanting to join um, a regional operator, a regional grid. Is there another country with an equivalently large grid as ours? How are they addressing a transition to renewables? This is a great question too. And one that I'm not going to be able to answer. <laughs> I am so focused on all the work that we have to do, um, mostly even in the Midwest. I do some work in other parts of the country, and I know more about the United States, but I know very little about um, what's going on in other countries. I mean, certainly there are um, other countries. Uh, I mean, Europe has uh, a lot of coordination in their grid. Um, I think Australia has a couple of grids that are not well connected because they have a large, of course, desert in between the areas of, of development or, or you know, where people live there. So sorry, can't answer much on that. If, if anyone else in our audience um, can help to answer some of these questions that I don't have a lot of expertise in, I'm, I'm happy to let other people talk. Why does the U.S. have three grids if e oh dear, pluribus unum, wouldn't it be better for us to collapse into one grid? Uh, I don't know a lot of this history either, um, but when you, and, and I think for anyone who, who did read the book, The Grid, um, you may have gotten some of that history. Um, when, I mean, as our utility or electric utility system was being built in this country, it started locally. Um, and so, I mean, we had, you know, individual towns having their own grid and their own generation um, and then connecting with other towns to, to share and balance. And then as utilities got larger, you know, they might begin to serve other towns in a, in a state. So it's really sort of grown out from that, that kind of um, just small local area when, when electricity was a very new thing to these grids that we have today. Um, I think part of the region that we, reason that we have the Eastern and the Western interconnection is the Rockies. You know, it's not an easy part of our country to build transmission lines across. Um, so I, I think that that's at least part of it. Um, and part of the reason that we have three is that Texas is the Lone Star State. Um, and they tend to wanna do things all on their own and always have it their way. And so that's the way they have done it. Um, I think that they are some, at least some parties in Texas after the recent event um, in February are starting to rethink that and whether or not it might be beneficial to them uh, 
to be more connected to other parts of the country uh, so that they can receive assistance when we're having um, sort of extreme weather events. All right, that's all the questions in the chat. Uh, feel free to add more to the chat or unmute. Um, and I'll ask a question in the meantime. Uh, you mentioned COVID and how there used to be, how the, how the pattern of how people use energy is different when they're working out of the home than in the home. Has that affected sort of like revenue for um, companies or just the way that they manage the grid? Um, great question. Um, it has, it has changed things somewhat, but I would not say hugely. When um, early on, when you know the shutdowns were happening, um, there were regular updates that I was seeing um, from utilities in terms of how things were impacting them, from you know both electricity demand to also you know what were they doing with their their employees, et cetera. But in terms of how they're operating things and, and electricity demand in the beginning, I think there was about a 10% drop in electricity demand because people were not in their, in their offices. And I think we probably also saw more, um, more businesses shut down. Uh, schools, you know, schools can be um, a, a large uh, electricity consumer also. And so, you know, those were not, uh, we didn't have as many lights on and, and heat on, et cetera. I think that there's been less of an impact as more people have gone back to work and more kids have gone back to school. There's probably still a little bit less um, electricity consumption now than, than pre-COVID. But I think also that that um, sort of the, the forecast, the diurnal forecast that we expect, there's a sort of a typical load shape for the day um, and it does vary a little bit season to season. So winter is a little bit different than summer. Um, but I think that there have been some, some shifts in that also, so that there is more of a, an uptick in the morning because people are actually heating their homes to, to stay there and it tends to smooth out a little bit. And then there's less of an uptick in the evening because there are fewer people coming home. Um, but I don't, I don't think that it has, made significant changes in terms of, you know, what utilities are doing to balance the system or the tools that they're operating. Um, but they definitely are paying attention to that. Is there a plan for wind turbines once they are at end of life? Looking at all the turbines in Iowa, I often think of what it will look like in the future, i.e. the wind turbine graveyards in Southern California. Really uh, another great question. Um, and one that I I'm not real involved in, um, but I know that there is a lot of focus going on right now in terms of what do we do with these, um, these large generators when they reach their end of life. And I think there's a lot of um, work being done in terms of how we can repurpose those. Um, you know, can we, can we take those wind turbine blades and I don't know if we chop them up or grind them up in, in terms of making a, a, a material that can be used in another way. Um, but it is an issue and one I think that we need to think more about. Um, possibly that will be the same situation for solar, though I think solar um, will typically have a slightly longer life than wind, wind plants. Um, and, and I think one of the other issues that we're facing with these kinds of technologies, which is similar to for cell phones um, is that um, there's, there are improvements all the time. So where I think we tend to think of wind plants as having about a 20, maybe 25 year life um, before they really need to get replaced. We are seeing some um, wind turbines being replaced at wind sites earlier than that because the new technology is so much more efficient. Uh, in terms of being able to produce more power at the same location. So this is a good question. Uh, I think an important one for us to be thinking about. It's not really where I do my work, so I can't offer a lot, um, but would love to, would love to hear uh, uh, ideas that other people have or work that people are doing on that. I know that I'm sure that, the, that your audience is really involved in some of these issues. So some of these questions that you're coming up with, I think are um, creating uh, openings for you all to do, do more good advocacy. <laughs>
All right, any last, anyone want the last question? I have a quick one, Heidi. Yeah. Is demand management recognized by all of the ISOs as a legitimate tool? Great question. And, you know, I should have talked more, Amy, about how we can use um, demand to help balance the system. Uh, yes, it is recognized as, uh, as a resource, as a tool. Um, we have in the Midwest ISO, we have what we call load modifying resources, and they actually do receive a capacity payment for being available to, you know, basically take their demand offline when we have these extreme events. Um, but I think the other thing that we're seeing more of, uh, certainly within individual utilities, they might have particular programs where they have access to be able to adjust um, air conditioning load or refrigerator load or those sorts of things. But I think that that is really, it's one of the, the areas of great potential when we think about how we manage the grid uh, as we move towards higher levels of renewables, it's really sort of a paradigm shift in thinking because up to this point, we've always thought, well, we just need to plan enough generation to meet the demand. And there's a lot more thought today about how do we both adjust generation and adjust demand so that we can keep that balance. So the, the demand side of it being a really important part of the equation to keep the balance. Um, and so a lot more work in terms of price responsive demand. So load, especially at the corporate level that will respond to prices, you know, um, our electricity really is much more expensive typically in the later part of the afternoon than it is other parts of the day. For individual consumers, we don't see that price variation throughout the day, largely, unless you were in Texas. Um, but, but being able to have load that, that responds is really important. And I think we will also see more utilities working with individual consumers um, and having the ability to adjust, adjust your heat a little bit, adjust your air conditioning, you know, turn off your refrigerator for 15 minutes, um, which is not really gonna make a difference in your food. So really great question. And I think a really important tool as we go towards higher levels of renewables. All right, we are out of time. Thank you all for joining us. And thank you, Natalie, for, uh, for spending some time with us and, and giving us so much knowledge. <laughs> great, no, great to be here. Thanks for all the great questions. And I really appreciate people taking some of their lunch time to, to hear more about your electricity system and how it works. And I hope that you, know, you, you share some of this and you have more conversations with your friends about about all these important issues. Um, so thanks, thanks for the invitation.